So just over a year in office now, um, I know you've worked around politics, but you've never held office before. So first year, how do you think it went? What did you learn? You know. I have been so incredibly um, gratified by the people that I've had a chance to get to know, the things that I've had an opportunity to learn, and that's really the approach that I've taken to my first year in office is, is listen and learn. So have been traveling all over the state in schools, meeting with local superintendents, um, continuing to foster strong relationships with members of the General Assembly, with our governor's office, because we have to have a unified team here in South Carolina if we're going to move education forward. Um, and so this first year has been such a joy, such a privilege. I think we've gotten a lot of really interesting and big things done for students, and I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, when you talk about listening and learning, is there anything that was kind of surprising that you didn't expect in that first year? You know, I think that there are just so many moving pieces. That is what is really hard to understand, even as someone who has worked around education policy for well over a decade in South Carolina now, I think until you're actually sitting in the superintendent seat, it's really hard to get your arms around just the incredible complexity of all of the things that move through the Department of Education on a daily, even hourly basis. But I'm really thankful for a great team of folks folks around me um, and that makes the work really joyful. Great. Um, so again, we spoke prior to the election about what you wanted to accomplish as a superintendent and really the biggest thing you hammered home in that interview was phonics and raising literacy rates. So what have you done so far to try to do that? We have made incredible progress here in South Carolina around aligning literacy instruction to what is known as the science of reading. And so phonics is certainly part of that, and it's so much bigger than that, though. It's fluency, it's content knowledge. Um, there are so many components to what our brain requires to learn how to read. So interestingly enough, when we're born, we're actually pre-wired for conversation like you and I are having now, but we're not pre-wired to read. And that takes explicit direct instruction from teachers in order to help connect all the different portions of the brain that have to be connected in order for us to be fluent readers. And so my first year, I have been laser focused on building a strong foundation in early literacy and ensuring that our teachers have the tools in their toolbox to do what needs to be done. Because we can have the best plans here in Columbia, and if that doesn't actually get translated into classroom instruction, it doesn't matter. And so the General Assembly has come together in an incredible partnership with us to fund every single K-3 teacher in South Carolina to equip them with the tools in their toolbox called the science of reading. So there's a professional development that we're doing. I actually have, have started doing it myself too. It's called Letters training and this gives teachers that foundational information that they need and I think you'll find in talking with teachers around the state that many of them initially were hesitant they said you know this is just going to be one more thing that we have to do this is just going to be the latest fad the latest and greatest and you know we'll move on from this shortly but in the feedback that we've gotten uniformly from teachers across the state who have done this they said why was I never told this before. It is completely transforming their ability to interface and diagnose their students where they are in their learning journey and then get them to where they need to be. So the sense of teacher empowerment that this is building is just one of the most incredible things I've seen and probably one of the things that I'm most proud of in my first year in office. What made you want to actually take the Letters Program course? You know, I firmly believe that leaders lead by example, and time is the most valuable resource that any of us have, and time is especially valuable for our teachers, and so I wanted them to know that I'm not going to ask them to do something that I'm not willing to spend my own time to do, and I also want to be able to have knowledgeable conversations with them about what they're seeing in their classroom experience, in their classroom practice, and ways that they are helping their students overcome the reading challenges that they have. Um, so it's been a really joyful journey. I have learned so much and it has been so exciting to hear the excitement in the voices of the teachers about what they're learning and about the difference that they're seeing it make in their classroom. One thing you've been pretty vocal about is school choice vouchers. 
um, and the bill that's currently working its way through would essentially in a few years allow really any student or family to go to a private or public school through taxpayer dollars. Why is that something you are in favor of? I'm an all of the above supporter of school choice options and we have a lot of really great options here in South Carolina. We have our traditional schools, we have magnet schools, virtual schools, public charter schools, there's even private and home school options. So we have a wide array of incredible opportunities for families here in South Carolina. But what we don't always have is access. And that can be because of a lot of different reasons. Perhaps it's access because you live in a rural community where there are just fewer options. Perhaps it's a challenge for access because of family income. Um, so there are a lot of different barriers to access. And that's one of the reasons why I am such a strong proponent of education choice in whatever form it takes, is that I believe fundamentally that parents know best where their student is going to succeed and every single student deserves the opportunity of getting into the right education environment for them and you know I think about my own journey um, I went to a small Christian school from kindergarten to fifth grade my mom homeschooled me from sixth to tenth grade and then I graduated from an incredible public school 11th and 12th grade so I had the whole range of options in my own education journey and my parents really sacrificed to make that possible and I see firsthand in my own experience how I needed different things at different stages in my journey so different siblings within a different family may need something different even a different child may need something different at different stages of their education journey and so what we're working to build here in South Carolina is what I like to call the education ecosystem of the future this is just like everything else in our life choice and unbundling we we can move between all these different kinds of streaming services, phone providers. I mean, choice is just a is just a normal aspect of every other area of our life. And I truly believe that we can have a strong system of choice here in South Carolina that is built on the foundation of strong public schools. And another thing that I think everybody will agree is crucial is um, raising teacher pay. Yeah. You've talked about that a lot. You've gone to bat for that a lot. What's your plan to do that and why is it so important? Well, we know research shows and common sense demonstrates that the number one influencer of student learning in that school building is a great teacher. And so we've got to take care of our teachers so that we attract the best and the brightest talent into the profession, and then we keep them in the classroom once they're there. And so continuing to increase teacher pay to make sure that we are competitive, not just here in South Carolina, amongst all of our districts, but with our next door neighbors as well. Because because there's a high mobility rate, um, especially in the Southeast. We have a lot of people moving in here. And so we have to make sure that our teaching profession is keeping track and keeping up with all the rest of our great professions here um, in the state. And so I'm firmly committed, as I know Governor McMaster is, he publicly stated in his State of the State address this year that he wants to see teacher pay at $50,000, minimum starting teacher pay at $50,000 by the year 2026. And I am firmly behind him in um, pushing that commitment forward. Um, we've had significant success um, and progress over the last few years with our General Assembly. I want to say in about the last five or six years, we've seen a 33% increase in starting teacher pay. And so we know there's more to do, but we've got a strong foundation and we're going to continue to push forward. Uh, book bans have been a hot topic all across the country. You've come out as a big supporter of the state your Department of Education being in control of choosing what books can and can't be in school libraries. Why are you a supporter of that and why do you think this topic has become as divisive as it is? You know, I think even five, ten years ago, it would have been a surprise to most people that we would have uh, materials in our public schools, some public schools, certainly not all, um, that are sexually explicit, things that I just don't think we should be purchasing on taxpayer dime or providing on taxpayer time to our students. Um, there are things that we have to reserve to families um, to decide when um, their students are introduced to these topics. And so I'm very thankful that our State Board of Education unanimously passed a regulation that does a wonderful job in balancing local control 
over instructional materials in our schools with the need to have an appeal process to the state board. State law clearly allows the State Board of Education and in fact gives them the obligation to approve or disapprove um, the content of instructional materials here in South Carolina and so the State Board has leaned into that authority. I fully support them in doing that and again I think this is just common sense. If people actually take a look at what what the regulation does. It refers specifically back to a section of South Carolina code that has been there for a long time that specifically um, addresses and identifies sexually explicit materials. And I think if anyone were to go to the legal code and read that list of things, I think there would be probably unanimous agreement that these are not things we want put in front of our children. That kind of leads into my next question. There are people who are against, you know, they think everything should be in the libraries and they hear the phrase book ban and they get worried about what that's meant in history before. What would you say to ease the concerns of people? Because there are parents who are going to watch this and they, they don't want any books to be banned. What would you tell them? I want to be really clear that what we're talking about here is um, a regulation of government speech. We are talking about materials that are purchased with government funds and provided by government employees on government times in traditional government schools. Um, this is in no way um, infringing on anyone's First Amendment rights to speech or to access materials that they want their children to access. There are many ways for parents to continue to access those materials if they decide that that is something that they believe their child should be um, exposed to. And so, again, I respect the authority and the right of parents to make those decisions for their students. And so that's really what this is all about, is just standing up for common sense and for the ability of parents to actually have a decision-making role in what is put in front of their child. We've talked a lot so far about, you know, things you're in favor of and what you accomplished and learned in the last school year, the last year that you've been in office kind of coincides with this past school year. This school year is kind of coming down to a close. We got 2024-25 coming up, I'm sure, sooner than any of us will think. Yes. What are your big goals for next year? You know, we are making incredible progress in early literacy. We have a lot more work to, to do, but I feel like that train has left the station and is really picking up great steam and momentum. We have a lot of work remaining to do on math, and this is something that um, we're seeing struggles with across the country. It's not unique to South Carolina, but right now we only have about 41% of our third through eighth graders that are on grade level in math, and, and so this is an urgent thing for us to address. The good good news is, is that we have a recipe for success that we have already followed here in South Carolina in early literacy, in our Palmetto Literacy Project schools. And so it's really all about what we've already talked about, that teacher professional knowledge piece, having high quality instructional materials, and then having strong principal leadership in that school building that is really coaching and mentoring teachers in their instructional practices. And so my number one budget request um, for this coming school year is to create a Palmetto math project just like we had a Palmetto literacy project that will enable us to follow that same recipe for success and really put a focus on math because I think that's going to be the next mountain for us to climb. I think a lot of people if they started a job about a year ago COVID wouldn't have too much of an impact on it um, and it's not just South Carolina as you said math rates down across the board across the country literacy rates all fell we're still picking up the pieces from COVID, specifically in education more so than in a lot of other fields. How uniquely difficult has that been for you where maybe COVID wasn't something you had to worry about, but now it's like you've got to go back and fix things a job you weren't even in place of when kind of all this happened. Yeah, well, I'm really thankful that here in South Carolina, we did reopen our schools much sooner than maybe some other states did. And so I think that the impact has been perhaps less here in South Carolina as a result of that. However, it's still very real. And I want to be clear, we had a lot of struggles prior to COVID that I think COVID really in some ways just shone a very bright light on. And so I think 
think the, the silver lining in all of this is that we have never seen our parents, our communities um, so engaged and so interested in what needs to be done to help our students get to where they need to be. And so that's one of the greatest opportunities, I think, of this job as state superintendent is to really go out and galvanize that interest and that energy um, and say, hey, here are some concrete things that we all can be doing to support our teachers, to mentor our students to ensure that they're getting to where they need to be. So we do have a, a long way to go and a short time to get there, as a great philosopher once said. Um, but I'm very encouraged that we're on a, on a positive trajectory here in South Carolina and that we have the right team and the right strategy in place to make sure that we are helping our students recover from that COVID learning loss. Um, one thing I'll mention in particular is high-dose high tutoring. Um, this is something that the research tells us is very effective, especially in helping students who may be behind in math. And this is actually tutoring that happens in school during the day, so it's intensive. It can happen in a small group, a pull-out session within a traditional classroom uh, setting. And, and we know that this works. The General Assembly actually appropriated some funds in this current fiscal year budget, and we are working in partnership with districts um, to stand up a pilot program um, to see what works and when we understand what works and what doesn't, how we might be able to scale more support for this across the state. Great. Um, I think this is my last question. Just in the last year, you, we talked about how, you know, earlier today you were at a bill signing that'll help with literacy. You've gone out for the Teacher of the Year ceremonies and surprised mm -hmm. students and kids. Has there been a moment um, where you kind of stepped back and you were like, wow, this is why I'm doing this? from a time, and oh, I, I know it's a lot to ask yeah. off the cuff, but is there anything that just like stands out? I think um, the, most, the most impactful and joyful moments of this job for me have been going to schools across the state that are beating the odds. Um, I have had the privilege of being in a number of Title I schools. So these are students that ha or schools that have high thresholds of poverty. Um, our average state poverty level here is 60% in South Carolina, which makes us a relatively poor state if you look at the entire country. Um, these schools that I have been in have over 80% of their students living in poverty and they are delivering incredible outcomes for their students. And so I go into these schools and I just say, what's your secret for success? What's the secret sauce? And the principals, of course, are very humble and modest. They don't talk about themselves. They talk about their great teachers. Um, but I think it all starts with great principal leadership. These are principals who are supporting their teachers, coaching their teachers, helping their teachers know how to use data to inform their classroom instruction. But it doesn't just stop there. They have that high quality professional development like we've talked about, and then the high quality instructional materials. And when you have those three legs of the stool in place, you see incredible results. You see schools that are retaining their teachers because their teachers have found a great culture and environment that they want to work in, a culture where they feel supported. And you know, that's one of, I think, the biggest things that I have learned in this first year in talking to teachers and listening to teachers is that they, they of course, want to be paid more and we're committed to that as we already talked about. But more than anything, they just want to know that people have their back. They want to feel like they are safe in their classroom, um, that they have the ability to deal with discipline issues that arise. Um, we haven't even talked about the impact of social media and cell phones on our kids, but we know that that is taking a huge toll on their mental health um, and that that also is creating enormous discipline challenges in our schools. And so I think that that is one of the most impactful things of my first year is just understanding from the teacher's perspective what it is that they need and then going out and being able to celebrate the success stories where they're happening because we have incredible successes that are happening in public education here in South Carolina. And I'm so proud and honored to be the state superintendent and hope that over the next three years of my service, we'll be able to continue to celebrate even more, even louder, um, incredible successes that I know we're going to see across our state.